Hello and welcome. I am Professor Raman and this is module 24 in International Criminal Justice. This module is on immunities under international law. Let us first discuss as we always do what the learning outcomes are of this module. Firstly, what purpose do immunities serve in international law? Secondly, what are the types of immunities available? And three, the effect of immunities on trials and international criminal law. The basic purpose of international law immunities is to safeguard the state and its officials from the jurisdiction of another state. This branch of international law stems from the idea of sovereign equality. This forms a mechanism that functions to prevent undue interference from other states and their officials in the workings of one state. This aspect of law, however, is in constant tension with the existence of human rights and compliance mechanisms to ensure the end of impunity. With the development of international criminal law, the requirement for the prosecution of those officials who tend to misuse the state machinery in order to commit crimes needs to be brought to justice. This tension perpetuates when the domestic courts of one state fail to conduct the prosecution of such officials under the maxim ot de der ot judicare, that is to extradite or to prosecute an obligation under customary international law. The possibility of prosecution of state officials can meet its end in two manners. Firstly, that the state officials are prosecuted in the domestic courts of foreign jurisdiction. And secondly, the prosecution be held by an international tribunal or court. For prosecutions to be held under the jurisdiction of a foreign state, the trend has seen an upsurge in contemporary times, largely because of the advent and adoption of the doctrine of universal jurisdiction of states over certain crimes. However, it has still not become easy, nor will it ever be easy, to conduct such prosecutions, since the grant of immunity is a result of interstate negotiated relations, and arresting an official is a huge hurdle before the proceedings for the prosecution actually start. There is a fine line between diplomacy and law, and in this chapter, we will deal with this line. This chapter will deal with the development of international law immunities. The two types of immunity will be scrutinized here, and we will study their application in international criminal courts and tribunals. We will also explain to you the jurisprudence that these courts and tribunals have laid down. Recent developments like Article 27 and 98 of the Statute of the International Criminal Court will be discussed in some detail. Let us begin with the first kind of immunity, that is immunity ratione personae. State officials on the basis of holding the office, that is ex officio, by virtue of their job, possess this form of immunity. This immunity extends only to limited state officials who form the part of senior most ranks, especially head of state, head of government and foreign ministers, the so-called plenipotentiaries under treaty law. Diplomats on special mission are also covered by this immunity. The basis for granting this form of immunity is that the state officials require a smooth conduct of state operations, which in turn requires them to travel without any sort of concern relating to fear or harassment by other states or by organizations or diplomatic agencies of other states. Therefore, the existence of cooperation treaties between states based on the underlying notion of the personal immunity or immunity ratione personae, wherein the rational basis for this is the person himself. Therefore, the existence of cooperation between states is founded on the underlying notion of immunity of the person or personal immunity or immunity ratione personae. This kind of immunity extends only until the official person holds this office. The personal actions 
along with the official actions are also covered by this immunity. And this in fact is the contentious part of this kind of immunity. The officials who are accorded personal immunity are absolutely immune from the criminal jurisdiction of a foreign state as if it were otherwise. The whole idea of personal immunity would be defeated. Personal immunity of course allows a person to conduct their operations freely. A leading case in this respect is the case known as the arrest warrant case from the International Criminal uh, from the International Court of Justice. The arrest warrant case mainly decided upon the availability of personal immunity to a foreign minister. In this case, the first one of the ICJ in fact that you are studying, the ICJ opined that the treaty cited by the parties and the availability of the criminal tribunals and the courts and their statutes do not yield a clear picture of the position of personal immunity. Therefore, the court resorted to using customary international law. In the opinion of the International Court of Justice on this point, no exception to the rule of personal immunity exists even when the official commits international crimes. The court therefore recognizes the purpose of that immunity which is to facilitate the untrammeled work of state officials even if that work or the personality of the individual leads to the commission of a crime, even an international crime. The second kind is immunity rationae materiae. Immunity rationae materiae attaches to a conduct carried out by an official on behalf of a state. Immunity rationae materiae attaches to a conduct carried out by an official on behalf of a state. This kind of immunity stems from the idea that a state enjoys with respect to its sovereign acts which are outside the very nature of being civil, criminal or administrative jurisdiction tasks of any foreign state. State immunity therefore not only protects the acts of the state but also the officials who perform them on behalf of the state. This, this is so that the officials while acting in their official capacity are mo mere instruments of the state and they are not therefore tremelled in the operation of their official functions. And thus the conduct of the officials can be attributable to the conduct of the state because they function as agents of the state. Immunity rationale material for an official with respect to official conduct entails immunity from the laws of a foreign state including criminal laws. Since this immunity is not attached to the official but to the conduct it extends even beyond the tenure of the office with respect to the conduct. Therefore, both incumbent and former officials are protected by immunity rationae materiae which exempts them from foreign criminal jurisdiction with respect to official acts so long as the immunity extends only to the acts and not to the person. This immunity extends to the person who also merely act on behalf of the state without even being a part of the state. Therefore, diplomats and envoys are covered under this. There are two important reasons for granting this kind of immunity, that is immunity rationae materia. One, that the individual is only an instrument of the state, which makes the attribution of responsibility to the officials for functions performed on behalf of the state not reasonable and therefore liable to be given immunity. Secondly, by granting immunity to the official, the state is also granted immunity as a consequence and this works in consonance with the idea of the sovereign equality of all states. As you know, the legend in international law is that all states are sovereign and all sovereigns are equal. The functional immunity forms a jurisdictional bar in general. However, when it comes to international crimes, functional immunity is not available. There are two main reasons for such an exception. Firstly, that the acts which require this kind of functional exception have attracted the unique privilege of functional immunity and they are state acts. However, state acts cannot be commissioned to carry out crimes, which would mean that the state in fact endorses the carrying out of crimes and this would be an absurdity. And secondly, these crimes act 
These criminal acts violate Hughes Cogan's norms, which hold much higher place than any other principles. This argument actually is not persuasive, as it has been struck down by several courts, like the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, etc. The case of Augusto Pinochet brings out an argument that links the concept of functional immunity and universal jurisdiction. This case introduces us to conventions like the torture convention, which accord universal jurisdiction and that cannot allow the availability of functional immunity. It can be said that universal jurisdiction is displacing, in fact, the concept of functional immunity. By the use of the tool of universal jurisdiction, states are eroding upon existing rules of immunity under customary international law, which is an interesting impasse because both the immunity as well as universal jurisdiction come from customary international law. The concept of immunities is largely an interstate concept. When the question of application of immunity comes up for consideration with regard to international tribunals, the answer seems to be simple. As the tribunals do not form horizontal relationships with, state, with states, the concept of immunity cannot be applicable to tribunals. Although the ICJ, as we have just discussed, in the arrest warrant ca case said that no clear position of law comes out of the statutes of courts and tribunals about the position that they accord to immunity in their domestic law. However, the ICJ stated that former and even incumbent official who enjoy the positions of plenipotentiary, that is head of state, head of government and minister of foreign affairs, their immunity cannot be prosecuted in international criminal tribunals and courts like the ICTY, ICTR and the ICC. How does this comport with the ICC's goal to end impunity? In fact, the Special Court for Sierra Leone also held in the Charles Ganke trailer trial that the principle seems now established that the sovereign equality of states does not prevent a head of state from being prosecuted before an international criminal court or tribunal. Interestingly, this presents a challenge to sovereign equality, immunity and universal jurisdiction. Notwithstanding the recent judgments, the idea of non-application of immunities in respect of international tribunals seems to be oversimplistic. In reality, the application of immunities is subject to a few other considerations. These considerations are inclusive of, firstly, whether the instruments that create the tribunals include any provisions regarding repelling immunity. Two, whether such instruments bind the state whose nationals are, uh, are, in con are under consideration or whose officials are under consideration. Now, the second consideration creates a more um, jurisdiction based discourse and therefore it forms a stronger defense for the states concerned. The tribunals and courts um, both ad hoc as well as permanent created under the international regime uh, under the United Nations and others are more likely to have a universally binding effect. For example, the ICTR and the ICTY. These tribunals were created by UN Security Council resolutions and these resolutions have a binding effect on member states of the United Nations as established under the Charter of the United uh, Nations Article 25. However, the problem of universal jurisdiction arises when the tribunal on the co or the court is not formed by the Security Council but is created out of treaties. Let us now examine the most recent developments, that is the International Criminal Court Statute and the role of immunity. As discussed in, previ in previously taught modules, the status of immunity in a judicial form is independent of the statute, which is followed by a court or tribunal. The Rome Statute provides for a provision repelling any claim to immunity under Article 27. Let's look at the text of Article 27. 27.1 uh, states, this statute shall apply equally to all persons without any distinction based on official capacity. In particular, 
official capacity as a head of state or government, a member of government or parliament, an elected representative or government official shall in no case exempt a person from criminal responsibility under the statute, nor shall it in or, in or of itself constitute a reduction of sentence. The primary effect of this Article 27 is to extend individual criminal responsibility even to state officials eroding their immunity under customary international law. With the application of this article, immunity disappears. Article 27.1 is also extending the jurisdiction uh, to the court. Apart from creating legal liability on actions of the perpetrator individually, Article 27.2 explicitly says immunities or special procedural rules that may attach to the official capacity of a person, whether under national or international law, shall not bar the court from exercising its jurisdiction over such a person. This article clearly prohibits the use of immunities. Notwithstanding the provisions of Article 27, there are certain bars on the jurisdiction of a court the International Court or others, which stem from Article 98 of the Rome Statute. Article 98, it is important to understand that Article 27 acts as a waiver of immunity for a state's own officials. However, when the question of immunity of some other state's officials are involved, then the fact that the International Criminal Court relies on the cooperation of states to make an arrest creates a hurdle in the proceedings of the court. This is where Article 98 comes in to simplify procedure and to tell us that notwithstanding uh, Article 27, Article 98 exists. Article 98 states, the court may not proceed with a request for surrender or assistance, which would require the requested state to act inconsistently with its obligations under international law with respect to the state or diplomatic immunity of a person or property of a third state, unless the court can first obtain the cooperation of that third state for the waiver of immunities required. Therefore, Article 98 not only creates an additional blanket of security, Article 27 says that no immunities must be available to perpetrators, whereas Article 98 directs the court to not request any surrender, where that surrender will result in the violation of international obligations of the arresting state in respect of international immunities of that state's perpetrator. This conflict arises only in situations where one of the states is not a party to the Rome Statute. This is because of the use of the phrase third state in the definition given under Article 98, which means any state which is not a party to the treaty, the treaty being the multilateral instrument created by the Rome Statute. Who are the beneficiaries of Article 98 of the Rome Statute? There are, there are many propositions that arise after we look at Article 98. The most threatening of these propositions is that Article 98 corners Article 27. If in a situation both states are parties to the Rome Statute and one state is required to make an arrest and surrender the official of another state, then the question of applicability of Article 27 is worth asking. If a state becomes a party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, after that it impliedly waives the immunity of its officials not only with respect to the International Criminal Court but with respect to any state from whom the ICC requests a surrender. If such an argument is considered, then Article 27 will not be affected. Therefore, the application of Article 27 is not remote, but the effect of the waiver of any state's official immunities will extend to that state that was requested for arrest and surrender. Is the cornering situation created by a juxtaposition of Article 98 and 27. A defense of Article 98, therefore, 
will not extend to any state party. Article 98 only prevents the requested state that is a state requested for arresting and surrendering either a party or a non-party from arresting the official of a non-party in case she is protected by immunities under international law. Article 98 does so by saying that it will not create any obligation for any state to arrest an official of a third state. It is important to know that arresting and surrendering the official and non-availability of immunities are two different steps which are both required to be met before the official can be prosecuted. Let us now consider the Omar al-Bashir case where the actual tension between articles 27 and 98 and the effect of the Security Council referral under chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations came to a head. The Security Council passed resolution 1593 which referred the situation in Darfur, Sudan to the International Criminal Court under Article 13b of the Statute of the International Criminal Court. An arrest warrant was released against Omar al-Bashir, the sitting head of state of Sudan in pursuance of Article 58. Sudan was not a party to the Rome Statute, which meant that any arrest warrant against Omar al-Bashir would have been in contradiction with Article 98 Clause 1. However, when the question of Security Council resolutions um, come up, then the answer to the conundrum created by 98 and 27 must be re-evaluated. One of the arguments in deciding this contention is that when the Security Council referral is made, then any order of the International Criminal Court would take its authority from the referral itself. This would indirectly mean that by reason of the referral, the International Criminal Court ipso facto becomes a subsidiary organ of the United Nations. However, this is not the case as the effect of a referral is only to create jurisdiction in the International Criminal Court and nothing else. Another argument can be based upon Article 103 of the Charter of the United Nations, which says that the Charter of the United Nations has an overriding effect to any other obligation. Therefore, in a situation where the Security Council passes a resolution, which by the means of Article 25 bind all the state's parties to the UN Charter, then such a resolution extinguishes the obligation of the state to respect the international laws of immunity for example, in the case of Omar al-Bashir. The Omar al-Bashir case um, created an interesting diplomatic impasse between the African Union and the International Criminal Court. However, even this argument is of no benefit, as in this situation, the Security Council resolution is quite clear in saying that Sudan and other concerned authorities are obliged to cooperate with the International Criminal Court, whereas other states are only urged. The International Criminal Court, however, was insistent on prosecuting Omar al-Bashir. The court said that the core principle of the Rome Statute is to end impunity. Therefore, despite Omar al-Bashir's uh, identity as head of state, it is crucial that he does not evade the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court on the ground of immunity. This is the main reason that studying immunities is so important because under modern international law, even a sitting head of state does not have immunity from the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and from foreign criminal jurisdiction. Other cases that you might want to read on this are the case of Hissen Habre of Chad and Augusto Pinochet, the Chilean dictator whose case was the beginning of sovereign immunity. Thank you.